Just wanted to wake up everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Boca Tov. Boca Tov, Boca Or. For the uh, camera, today is April 28th, 2013. South Jersey Men's Club, if you think this is Hadassah, you are in the wrong place. Um, we have a lot of people who want to speak today, which is, which is great. Uh, and so I'll bounce around, but, the, but for me, the number one priority is, is the announcement of the slate of officers to, uh, to seek your vote for the, the new leadership of, your, of this organization starting July 1st. Bob Greenberg, as, uh, as immediate past president, had the responsibility of putting together a slate which then comes to a vote at our next meeting. Right? And uh, Bob is rushing right now to, uh, to get up here and present everybody the slate of officers who have uh, agreed to stand for election. So, Robert, you, you need to stay next to me so that you can get the microphone. A hard point election. Um, I'm, I'm going to call out the names of the nominees, and if they would just stand so that everybody can recognize who they are. Uh, for president, Don Weisenstein. Just no, stay standing. Um, for uh, external affairs, vice president is Richie Moskowitz. For operations is Dave Schwartz. You could stand, Dave. Come on, come on. Uh, for athletics is Barry Rosenberg, who is right now playing baseball. Um, Dick Knopf is membership. Where, where is he hiding? Oh, there he is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the vice president for finance is uh, Ed Stein. <laughs> Uh, Nelson, uh, Nelson, uh, Marty Raffner will be assistant treasurer. You can stand here, please. <laughs> assistant treasurer, come on, stand up. Uh, for 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 religious affairs, it's going to be Bill Roth. Hey, somebody, a new face. Communications is Randy Acorsi. Okay. <laughs> we got an ex All right, for the recording secretary is uh, Dave Nydorf. Hey. Uh, our JCRC representative is okay. my friend Ed Silver. Our immediate past president is Jerry Mitzner. So he's our, he, will, he is going to be the immediate past president. All right, and then the past presidents. Myself, we got Mike, we got Larry. Come on, you can stand up, Mike. Come on. Stand up, Mike. Come on, stand. All right. Uh, Larry Nadelson's not here. Dave Wynn. And now we have positions. Now we. Oh, Moskowitz. Yeah. Well, he's supposed to have been. He's supposed to have been standing for the other thing. Okay. Now, we 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 also have. Positions without portfolio. These are positions which will be assisting as necessary in the different functions. We have Barry Adler. Where's Barry? <laughs> he don't understand. He's had a rough week. And Ned Bulmash. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Barry, you can stay. Gentlemen, this, this is the slate that is being proposed. We do have other people who have, in, who have indicated an interest on um, being on the board, and if you talk to me after the meeting, we'll take your names, and you'll go into consideration for the next board, which will come up in 2015. Thank you, gentlemen. Bob, thank you for, uh, for doing a fine job. So next month, we will have an official vote 
nobody is in until the election is held and certified by our Board of Elections Committee, who is Bob. <laughs> you, 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 something about this? Absolutely. Okay. Is there any cap on campaign spending? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Corzine is on his way here to, to make a determination about that. Um, all right, there, there are several other people who, who have uh, announcements that, that we want to get to. Ed Silver is not here. Oh, there he is. He, he moves faster than a speeding bullet. In my relationship with him, I'm the only one who moves. <laughs> yeah, uh, and, and you're, uh, okay, I don't, we're not going to repeat that for that. Uh, as you know, I uh, represent the uh, men's club at the uh, JCRC. For those of you who don't know, the JCRC has a uh, subgroup called Bookmates. Bookmates is an organization of volunteer readers who go into uh, underprivileged neighborhoods and they read to the children in schools. It's a very popular program. In fact, they can use more volunteers if anybody's looking for something to do in their spare time to read to children. In any event, I'll give this uh, notice to Randy to put out on their uh, email. There's going to be an uh, appreciation for the volunteers on June 11th, Tuesday, at 7 o'clock. There will be refreshments. Registration is required. Uh, it will all be on the uh, email for you to take a look at. We invite you to participate. Yes. Yes, Dick, it's about that, right? I just want to tell you, I am a bookmate, and I can't tell you how much satisfaction I get out of going in uh, on Monday uh, afternoons or Monday mornings to uh, uh, Forest Hill Elementary School in Camden and read to the six-year-old kindergarten kids. Last year was, I, I guess I'm moving down, last year was first grade, now to be being devoted to Camden. It's really a like joy. Uh, these kids are enthusiastic. They're, uh, this is the time when you really want to read to kids to get them to understand and, and love it. And I can tell you, it's uh, it's something I uh, highly uh, enjoy, and uh, and I think you will get more out of it than you put in by far. Great, thank you, Dick. So you're the yeah, I'm, I'm the microphone. Um, uh, Lance Silver, Lance Silver. A member of, our, of the South Jersey Men's Club wants to take one minute. Come over here, because I'm the microphone. Thank you. Hey, guys. I, am, I live in Burlington County. And if anybody lives in Burlington County, I'm running for freeholder. First time I think we'll have a Jewish freeholder. And there's a lot of things that we can do in the county. But please vote for me on June the 4th. If you live in Burlington County, I have a little thing here. I'll give it to you. And the primary is June the 4th, and we can win, and there's a lot of things that can happen and do with all the school districts, et cetera. I don't have to tell you about it, but I'm not supposed to. Anyway, right. um, thank you, and I just, if you're question, in Burlington how many, County. How many people live in Burlington County here? One, two, three. Four? You live in Burlington County, Steve? Three. Four. Okay. I got, I got Mr. Silver. All right. all right. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Perlow. Um, Dave Wynn. Thanks, guys. Uh, a couple of things. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, we're in the middle of the uh, softball season. Uh, we have not done very well now, but I'm sure we're going to, you know, go like gangbusters towards the end of the year. How, how are we doing? Two and four, and we're playing. It's, an eight it's about as good as the Phillies. Uh, Your president-elect has a 100 batting. <laughs> I do have a hit. And, and he's, he's leading the team in extra base hits. <laughs> and he's got one hit, right? I gave up my 16th spot in the batting order. Do <laughs> uh, you know why they have a 16? Because they couldn't find an 18. <laughs> uh, when, when I left the softball team, it was because I wanted to contribute something on a net positive basis. So by not attending the game, I added to the success of the team. And you did. Because yeah. <laughs> I went 0 for July and 0 for August. 
something. Well, th that's very good. Since we stopped playing in July, time. you can <laughs> certainly go 0 for August. The other thing that uh, uh, recently happened was we had uh, our annual bowling tournament, won by Bethel. I still don't know if we had a team uh, because I, I'm, I'm not involved uh, that much in, in uh, running the things over there anymore. But hopefully when we get the sports, we'll get information out and hopefully we'll have teams in the various sports that uh, we do play. The, the other thing I want to talk about is, sports. Uh, sports. again, sports. Uh, we have the uh, uh, Jewish Film Festival, of which I'm on a committee, uh, Gary's on a committee. Uh, today is the last day, and this afternoon, particularly for men, we have a double, a double feature of films dealing with uh, uh, sports. The uh, movies this afternoon, uh, primarily the main feature, is a movie about the coach of the uh, team that won the uh, European Championship, uh, the Israeli team that won the European Championship, and then later on... In soccer? In basketball. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought I mentioned it was basketball. And, and then afterwards, he left the uh, Israeli team and went to coach the West German team, which a lot of people didn't like. Uh, and the West German team was terrible, and he made them a much better team. But the movies have been fabulous this week, and I really would recommend that uh, we have some people go. Uh, and if so, you'll see me. Gary, you're going to be there too? Uh, Gary, um, Dick Knopf, I, I know, has gone to... Uh, uh, some of the events. Uh, uh, Larry Nadelson, also a member here. It'd be nice if we had some more folks go, and today, particularly if you like basketball, would be a good day to go. It, it's held where? Oh, yes, good. It's at 2.30 at the Rave. So you go, you, you know where the Rave is. The Ritz Theater is now called the, the Rave uh, Theater. And uh, so we also have a movie this evening, which is not necessarily for men. We'd like you to go. If you're going to go this evening, it's at 7.30, and the movie is called Melting Away. Uh, it's uh, about, uh, <laughs> anyway, I have, I have the brochure. I have a few more brochures left. It's the last day. But Help yourself to brochure. The movie this afternoon is, is it, called? Oh, Playoff. 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 It's, it's at 2.30. And uh, hopefully I'll see some more people here. That if you're a JCC member, it's $9, otherwise it's 12 Right. And if 10 of you go, and buy t uh, 10 or more go and at the same time, buy a ticket at the same time, you get 10% off your ticket. Okay. Okay. If you recall, we had decided we were, in order to try to get some of our members to go play ball, to go to some of the games, we're going to send out the schedule. Do we have that anywhere? We did send it out. Oh. Okay, but but the the problem is it just it merely mentioned the name of the of the field without an address, or, and for me it made it difficult to find it because all it says is Parkland or whatever it is, and and it didn't really tell me. I have directions to all of the fields. Yeah. Like, give it. Okay. Yeah. If the directions, if I were to send all the directions for all the fields, it would take about four pages on on an email. Uh, but uh, you, if, he ha if he has it, great. If you want to, if you want to send it out. If you great. can then send it out again with the rest of the schedule, that'd be that'd be great. It'd be nice for us to show up uh, on a on a day when we do, we don't have our meeting here to to go there and show up and cheer on our team. And if we make the playoffs, uh, we're going to make the playoffs anyway. The question is, do we make the real playoffs? Uh, it will be July, and certainly at, if we do, if you don't do before then. We'd like to get a, a good group at that time supporting us. And you think it's are still available for next week's game? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, want, you want to tell anybody, 10 people come, this, it's the same price, zero. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Bob? Could you make sure that that schedule goes to Randy so that it goes, it, it gets to everybody? Yeah. Because I never got whatever schedule you set out. Okay. I, I sent it to, to the black. I have the run, so I'll give it to Randy. Okay. Okay. And uh, Don, I've got the schedule instead of the general schedule. I have a schedule just for our team, so I'll send you that particular schedule. Okay. 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 Um. Thank you, Dave. Is, is, are there any other um, people who are? Um, oh, Richard. I'm up. Hi. I uh, just wanted to, as a membership chairman let you know a couple of things. One is uh, we're working on a new flyer, <clears throat> application flyer, 
Uh, anybody wants that, Randy and I talked about it. Hopefully we'll be working on that. But we're also going to be sending out uh, survey forms for both the members in general as well as the athletic, the, the JAG membership, uh, not JAG member, the JAG survey form. So if anybody's interested, I know Don and I are getting together along with David. If anybody's interested in joining us and working on the survey form, getting it out to all members, I think the idea on David is a good one. Anytime we have a new member, we need to give them both the athletic form and, and the uh, survey form to see what, what they're interested in uh, for, the, for the men's club. And that's it. Thank you. Right. Question for David. Yeah. Would there be any thought about sending a survey out to ex-members to see what invited them not to continue? I think that's an excellent idea. Would you help me with that? I'd help you okay. with that. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, we need to do that. And Marty, Marty, are you here, Marty? Where's Marty? Marty is back there. All right, he'll, he'll, uh, we're, uh, we'll talk about this later, but uh, Ed's idea of sending out a survey form to X members, so we would need some help probably from you in finding out who those. Um, okay, I want to bring up Dave Schwartz, who, uh, who will introduce our guest speaker. Oh, I'm sorry. Wait a second. Sit back down again, will you? <laughs> you know, one of the problems in getting old is the, is the, the old timer's disease sets in. And uh, I do want to give a few minutes. Mike Perloff just returned from Israel. And, uh, and I, I'm really interested in what he has to say. So, Mike, I apologize. Can you put this on? Sure. There you go. Good. Well, I just came back from uh, roughly a month in Israel, and it was one of those very efficient type trips. It was like three trips at once with only one airfare. One part was my family joined me after I was there for a week, week and a half, and we did some touring. And for those of you with grown children, I think you appreciate it's the first time that we traveled together in 25 years and got to know each other as adults. That was, it was really wonderful, tremendous. And uh, some people had emotions that they didn't know they had at the uh, Western Wall. Some people had emotions uh, when they came upon, when they were at the Syrian border. Uh, and it was, family-wise, it was, it was marvelous. It was truly a trip of a lifetime. As my children told me, my children, the baby's 33, so you know what I mean. But they're still our children. Another part was that I try when I go to Israel to do work on an army base. Uh, if you remember, there's a program called Sarel, Volunteers for Israel, and people from uh, about 45 countries have done it so far so since 1982, and they get about 4,000 people a year. And what do you do on the army base? You take the place of a reservist. You do whatever that reservist would do, so long as it doesn't put you in harm's way or needs additional training or technical training that you can't learn in a day or two. So I was working on a, a logistical training base between Gaza and Beersheba. And the group that I was with had people from Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Sardinia, Italy, and of course the United States. And it was truly wonderful. It's one of these bases where you have the combat troops from the whole south, they come and they do practice scenarios. So there's long lines of tanks, and in one that's area, they'll practice what happens if you're surrounded. And they, they do these simulations. In another part of the base, they have a big field where there's tanks with missing one tread, like maybe it was blown off, or turned over, or jeeps that are turned over, or stuck in a tank trap. And they practice what do you do? What's the best way to rescue people or extricate the vehicle? And when they finish the training, they turn in all their, their, their kit, their goods, uh, the stretchers, the canteens, everything. So my group, one of the things we did was we made sure that whatever was returned was in working order, wasn't torn, wasn't out of, sh uh, or things weren't missing. And if it was, we took it out and shipped it off somewhere else. Occasionally, um, there's other jobs on other bases, and, and, and I, I'll go into that some other time. I only have a few minutes. But, so that was part 
part two of my trip. Part one was with the family. Part three of the trip was a dream for me. Because when the family went home, and I, I first I visited some people I knew up in Haifa, but when I had appointments, and you know, I do Israel advocacy work. And over the years, I've, I've gotten some networking when it comes to the diplomats and, and some of the generals and such. So one day, uh, I contacted a, the general I know who's in charge of logistics for the whole IDF. And he's not Jewish. He's a Druze. General Mufid Ghanem. So he wanted me to come to watch a, a promotion exercise where a whole group of soldiers were being promoted to major. So I took the train to Tel Aviv. They picked me up in a staff car. I can't believe it. Right? And there was a driver and somebody to translate. Because you may have some people say, everybody speaks English. Nah, it's not true at all. Most of, the, most of the people you'll meet, if you're on a tour, remember everybody's paid to make you feel comfortable. Everybody you see almost is there being paid so that you're comfortable and feel like you're almost at home in an exotic way. But if, when you're traveling amongst Israelis, it's not that way you'll run into quite a few who, whose English proficiency is about on par with your Hebrew proficiency. Okay, so that was great. When I, 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 I took me and I, we spoke for a while and um, then we went over to the graduation parade grounds and I mean again, I can't believe it. I'm sitting in one of the VIP sections and, and I sat through the whole thing, it was great. The whole thing was great. I was able to video about a half hour of it which I'll, I don't think I can post online because they don't usually want the faces of active soldiers uh, shown where, where the public can get it. But from there, uh, I had more meetings. I had some of the, diplom the diplomats that I know. If you remember from Philadelphia, we had Georg Becker and Yuri Palti and Danny Kuttner were different council generals. Well, I was able to meet with all of them, at, either at the foreign ministry or um, Uri Palti is now ambassador to Nigeria, so I, I spoke to him a little bit. So that was good. But probably the most exciting thing for me, besides the family uh, bonding and being together, was I also had a meeting with the World Zionist Organization leadership. And I knew them because they worked with us on those Israel advocacy conferences that I've been doing for the last year or so. And they've been a partial sponsor. So I ended up completely shocked. You know the terminology guide that I developed, some of you have seen it, on choosing the right words when you speak about Israel. The World Zionist Organization, number two guy said to me, we want to publish it. I said, okay. Yeah. Totally knocked me for a loop because that wasn't what I was even there to meet him about. That was a great meeting. When it was over, I took a cab to the uh, Ms. Radochutz, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And typically, the three or four people that I was supposed to meet each thought that the other had sent my name into security. So they wouldn't even let me in. So I called up, if you remember, Rashlan Abu Rakan, who was the vice counsel, the previous vice counsel, uh, who's also not Jewish, he's a Druze. So I called him up. And uh, he said, oh, I, I, I thought someone so was doing it. I said, let's get him on the line, too. That was Gior Becker. Gior Becker said, I'll take care of it. So they got me in, and we're having lunch and discussing different things about the programs that I do. Well, who comes and sits down? A young a lady, not so young. Now, I never knew her personally, but I think you'll recognize the name. Her name is Leora Herzl. And Leora Herzl, yes, was a relative of, of, the, of uh, yeah, no. Theodore Herzl. And Theodore Herzl, uh, like Lincoln and like Washington, has no direct descendants. So she was like, uh, you know, one of her, her parent was related to a family member of Herzl. And there's like several hundred Herzls in, in Israel. None of them, of course, directly related. They're all basically cousins or second cousins. But this lady is also the Deputy Director General for all North America affairs in embassies and consulates. And she became interested in that terminology guide. I'm floating on air, folks. I mean, you know, 
many of us in our jobs just want to make a difference. Uh, I've already taken a book, so and I bought a book and I, I took a book, but uh, all those books are there free of charge. Your only responsibility is to read it if you take it. Uh, so uh, I think this book exchange is, is a great opportunity to, uh, to get a whole bunch of, uh, of, of books that you might like to read. And remember, the worst place for a book is on a shelf. The best place is next to your bed or uh, in your hands. David. Gentlemen, good morning. Um, I'll hold it. First of all, speaker next month, with the help of Michael Perloff, is the head of security, Israeli consulate in Philadelphia. So we can look forward to that. Um, speaker today, I'm pleased to say, I read about it in The Voice a few months ago. Jacques Dehan is president, and he promised to give me a, that he'll make a little bio. I'm just going to take, take a moment with a few words. He's president of Michelle Cluzel Chocolates. And I guess a division is noble ingredients. Noble. One's the parent or the other. In any event, I read about him. I was fascinated for a number of reasons. Uh, he has four children. He's married, a member of Kabad. Been here about, what, 15 years? 20. 20. And um, when I saw chocolate, that was piqued my interest first. <laughs> In the first minute of the conversation, he made, made bring a sample that piqued my interest even further. <laughs> in any event, we met for a few minutes a few weeks ago at his office, believe it or not, right down the street in uh, West Berlin or Berlin. He has a warehouse in Pensalken as well. He came years ago with a different chocolate company, evolved into uh, Michel Cluzel, and has a wonderful facility down here in Berlin that has a little uh, museum, uh, like a cafeteria that he can bring people in. I was going to get us down there, and I didn't even bring it up because was not big enough to accommodate uh, this many people. And they have a kitchen as well, and I'm not sure exactly what they'll do. So in any event, uh, I thought it would be interesting to bring someone who grew up in France. He could, could just briefly touch on uh, the Muslim situation from when he was there to the, today, and, and notwithstanding his, him being a successful business, a Jewish businessman in our community. So I welcome Jacques Dahan. Thank you very much. Good morning. Uh, first of all, uh, bonjour, bonjour. We can say we can we can do everything in French if everybody understands. Of course, that. That's a good start. First of all, to to all of us, Chag uh, because today is a special day. It's like Baomer, and I think that you know it's very important. And I notice that mostly because you know I'm probably the only one in this room that is not shaved. Although normally after the 33rd day of Omer. We could shave, so I apologize because you're all shaved cleanly and I'm not. So, so, um, so thank you very much for having me here. Um, you know, when Dave contacted me at first, I said, you know, that's uh, that's very interesting and flattering, and, and I'm not sure that you know people would want to listen to me. It's already very hard to have your own children listen to you, but to have six, thirty, forty people that you know come specifically to hear you for half an hour. That's really it. So I said, I can't pass this opportunity. So please, yes, of course I'm coming. So thank you again. Uh, so my name is Jacques. I came here uh, 20 years ago, but I think that, you know, I'm, I'm truly a wandering Jew. Uh, you know, I was born in Morocco. Uh, at that time, you know, you know, the situation was still under the, the French protectorate. And a couple of years later, we left, uh, my father first, and then, you know, uh, we joined him. It was in 1962, I was three years old, so you can do the math, and uh, we arrived in Paris. So I grew up in Paris, and, and quite honestly, I mean that, you know, the, I would say that the relationship between Muslims and Jews at that time, whether it was in Morocco or whether it was in France, was probably even better than with Goyim. Why? Because in fact, we shared about the same thing. We're all in a different country. Uh, some of us have picked that country, but I mean that, you know, mostly for the Jews, there was no, no other alternative in the sense that, you know, after the independence of Morocco, they basically, you know, they said, okay, you know, you take it or leave it. So thanks to a, a French minister called Crémieux, most of the Jews that were in Algeria uh, became uh, uh, French citizens. And since my father married my mom, my mom that was born in Algeria, so we're able to get this citizenship. So we moved to Paris, and 
I would say that you know the anti-Semitism that you know I've, I've uh, encountered in my life when I was young was really mostly from you know non-Jews, but not at all from the Muslims. But you have to realize that in the 60s, I mean that you know, and I was living in downtown Paris. Uh, it, it was really a blend. I mean, that you know, and that's something that you know uh, was strange to me even when I moved here uh, 20 years ago is the fact that here you have a lot of communities. So, which means that you know, most of the Jews will live together. And I remember that when, when I, I came here the first time, the CEO of the company I was working for at that time said to me, He said, uh, You're Jewish? Okay, you have to live in Cherry Hill. I said, What do you mean you have to live in Cherry? He said, Because that's the way. You have your Jew, your Jew, so they, you have synagogues there and everybody lives there. There. Okay, in Paris, you know, in my in the same uh, flat uh, apartment that we were living in the same building, you had uh, definitely Catholics uh, from Spain, from France. You had Muslims, you had Jews, and all this world was uh, uh, existing and living together in a very good harmony. And at the same time, you know, with the Muslims, basically we had, we were very friend friendly because most of the time they were coming almost to a town nearby. And we used to invite them, and they used to invite us when they had a special ceremony, a feast or something. Or at least send us the invitation, and we would thank them, and we would give them a gift, and everything like that. Uh, then I went to, to the army, because at that time there was a draft in France, so when I was uh, 21, because I had the opportunity to, to, to move it back. Normally it's between 18 and 21. And at that time, quite honestly, same thing. I mean, that you know, uh, I was wearing every morning my tefillin and everything like that, so I warned the people that were with me, and I said, oh, don't be scared, you know, in the morning if you see me with something on my head and everything like that, don't worry, I, I won't transform myself in a, in a wolf, in a werewolf or whatever it is. It's it's just the way it is. So it, it went fine, except that we had some people that were really anti-Semitic, but not at all in the Muslim community. I think that, you know, uh, the, the, the phenomenon that we see today, mostly in France, but all over Europe, is, is I think it's linked to two parts. The first one is the fact that, you know, this new generation that was born in France, that were really, really, I would say, French native per se, but from the parents that were uh, from Algeria, from Morocco, from Tunisia and everything like that, never really recognized that they were part of the French people. So they used the system, but they never believed, okay, I'm real French. So that was the first problem. I think that you know, they, they've completely uh, missed the integration part and you know, these people that were living mostly in the outskirts of Paris couldn't find a job because their name was Mohammed or uh, something else. And so basically, you know, they felt that you know, they were rejected. While at the same time, they were also rejected in their own country. Because going to Algeria or going to, uh, to Tunisia or Morocco, you know, people would say, oh, you're not a Moroccan or you're not an Algerian, you're a French. So I mean that, you know, they were really in a very bad spot. And I think that, you know, the second phenomenon that I think killed really the relation uh, or the relationship that, you know, Jews and Muslims could have or the good relationship was definitely the dish. Because everybody in this uh, suburb was getting a dish. They were getting Al Jazeera. And my guess is that, you know, they were completely polluted. They had no work, so they had nothing to do but watch television. Uh, their parents were looking at these movies or these programs because you know, it was in their own language. The kids learned the language. And quite honestly, every time that I go to Paris, and I'm leaving next week uh, to go there again, it's completely different. I mean, that you know, now you go into supermarket, you will hear a lot of uh, Arab music. I mean, that you know, uh, you will, you will go into the metro, you will see a lot of people speaking Arabic while they were not even born in an Arab country. But they, they kept that and the communitarism is very strong. And there is a part of Paris, uh, you know, they, they, they have several uh, departments around, of course, in all France. But, you know, around Paris, there are, you know, something that's around that. And there is one called the 93, which is uh, called Saint-Saint-Denis, which honestly, if a Jew goes there, is not sure that he's coming out alive. And that's completely ridiculous. That was a place where 20 some years ago, I was already in the business and I was visiting some customers there. There was not much problem. So I, I would say that, you know, the situation not evolve uh, in the right way. And uh, quite honestly, I, I'm afraid that, you know, it won't evolve that way. Uh, so that's why, you know, a lot of Jews and 
a, a lot of people that you know have the means and they have uh, the money to, to do that have left. And why do we see a surge uh, you know, in Israel in all the housing market, in the housing business? It's because you have a lot of French Jews that you know had the euro that was very strong. Most of the time compared to us, it's about 30% uh, higher than the dollar. And all the pricing all the, on the housing market is in dollar in Israel. So, so you know, they, they said, wow, that's cheap. And so ultimately, all the pricing goes up. As a matter of fact, my daughter, uh, who made her aliyah three years ago, uh, got married last year. And I spoke with her like uh, half an hour ago or an hour ago. And she's trying to find an apartment. And it's ridiculous. I mean, I'd say, I said, don't even try to buy. Because right now, the, min the minimum price for an apartment will be around $400,000 or $450,000 for three bedrooms, which is very expensive if we look at what we have around us. But anyway, so, so that's, that's a little bit my story uh, about growing up in, in Paris. And of course, if you have questions, I'll be happy to answer that. Uh, when I moved, I'm sorry, yes, yeah, no? When, when I moved here, I was already married. I had already three kids. Uh, and um, at first, it was a, 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 somehow a challenge. A challenge in, in two ways. First, I've been in the chocolate business for 28 years. So that means that I was in the chocolate business uh, before. And uh, the company that I wor worked for at the time called Coco Barry had a plant in, uh, in Pensoken. And um, one day they said they came to me. I was about to leave the company because after 10 years, nothing came up and I wanted to change. And they said, okay, we have an opportunity. Would you like to go to the US? I went home and I said to my wife, I said, okay, this is the opportunity. We, we had never been here. We didn't know. We, you know, you, we watch movies and everything like that, but we had no clue. So I said, what do you think? She said, well, okay, for how long? I said, three years. Uh, okay, fine, let's move. So we packed everything. I quit, I mean, not, I quit my job there, even though it was the, the same company, but you know, and, and you know, we arrived and everybody was telling you're crazy, you have a good job, you have all your family and everything. No family here whatsoever, uh, no friends, and nothing. But we said, okay, let's do it. And quite honestly, at first, it was not easy. Not easy for me, first of all, because my English was uh, worse than it is today. So, I mean, that's, that makes uh, something that was, I was like, sometime afraid to pick up the phone and to have somebody from Tennessee or from Texas calling me and say, my God, I don't understand a word of what you're saying. <laughs> so so that, was, that was a big challenge. That was a challenge also for my daughters. We don't understand the people. You still don't. <laughs> Good. So that's why. That's a little better. So, and for my daughters, so they went first to Kalman Academy because we are living on the west side of Cherry Hill, uh, where we know Mr. Melitz, as a matter of fact, because his kids were in, my, in some of my daughter's uh, class. And sure? What's your wife's name or what's your daughter's name? So my wife's name is Laura, Laura. and I have four daughters. Uh, Jennifer, that lives in Israel. Jessica, that is in Florida. She's doing her PhD in psychology. Abigail, who's the pastry chef at Le Bec Fin in Philadelphia. And I have a younger one, uh, uh, Rebecca, I was almost 15, and she thinks that she's almost 22 already. But uh, <laughs> were they born here? Or were they Only one. Rebecca was born here. Yeah. Only one was born here. Yeah, the other one. But we maintained for all of them uh, the fact that they needed to the speak. The other ones that weren't born here are they citizens? Yes, everybody's citizens. Everybody's oh, it's been a while. Okay. Yeah. So, so, so we came here, and again, at first, it was not that easy. Uh, but I mean that, you know, to me, what was very important was the link with the Jewish community and mostly through synagogue. Because I felt that, you know, no matter what language you speak, you go into a shul and, you know, you feel that, you know, all these people, they pray like you. And so whether it was Zichrono Levracha Rabbi Khan or um, Cantor Shapiro, Zichrono Levracha also, two, two great guys and, and others, but I mean that, you know, that were probably the first people that I met at that time. You know, for me it was very, very important. And so I took my children every Shabbat to synagogue. And I think that, you know, that was basically the link that, you know, made us something, uh, I mean, some, somehow a little bit easier to live in a new country. And then, you know, they learned to speak English and it was better, yeah. I just have to compliment you. Uh, you actually participated in the services. You speak fluent Hebrew, so that's fantastic. 
I remember one day at Boss Missa for one of your daughters where she actually said some of the prayers in French. Yeah. And that was a fantastic experience. The French and then Hebrew and then English, and it was great, fantastic. Yeah, that was, I think, Jennifer, when she had her bat mitzvah, she, you know, the, the, the Dvar Torah that she did, I said, look, you have to do it absolutely in English, of course, because that's, you know, the main audience. But we had also some people, including my parents, coming from France, and they d didn't speak any English at all. So they had to translate everything and do that as well in French. For them, it was a challenge. I think that they managed. And, oh, yeah, and they, they, I think that they, they liked it. So, so far, they, they, they love to do that. So uh, here we are. A uh, few years later, the company uh, that I was working for merged with another company in Belgium. And at that time, uh, they said to me, you know what? Uh, that's very nice, but we don't need you anymore in the US. So that's, at that time, I didn't have, of course, uh, my citizenship. I had only a visa. So uh, they said, OK, you have to leave. And I left on the spot. I mean, that you know the way it is, uh, you know, the American way. I said, OK, that's very nice of you. I went back home, and I said, OK, what do we do? So we put the house for sale and everything. I said, what do you offer? And I didn't like what they had to offer in, in, in Europe. And mostly, I think that, you know, I felt that I don't know, maybe somehow I was a little bit a visionary. I felt that you know, the, the evolution in France was not good for our kids. And I said, look, we will try to find a way to stay here. And Bao Hashem, I mean that you know, one of the customers that I had was in Lakewood, called me and he said to me, he said, uh, Jacques, uh, would you like to come to us? So I went to Lakewood and I discovered another world. Uh, I, I'm sure that you've been to Lakewood. Lakewood is like Nebrak. I mean, that you know, you go, you have all the restaurants are, are kosher, or, uh, most of them. I went into this company, and for the first time, I heard something that was, I felt very funny. It's the fact that, you know, they looked at me and they said, you're Jewish? You don't look like you're Jewish. I said, well, are you kidding? In France, I'm, I look like a Jew here. So, so that was interesting. And I worked for a company also in the chocolate business called Astor Chocolate. And you've heard probably about them. Very nice, from Orthodox uh, uh, Jews that are there. And that was very interesting because every day at 2 o'clock, or roughly that time, uh, in the speakerphone you will hear Mincha, Mincha, Mincha. And then you have like 20 guys that come up into a big room like that. And we dive in for 15 minutes Mincha, and then we go back to work. So that was, that was interesting, and interesting to deal also with a family business in terms of the chocolate. Um, and at that time, I had known the, the Cluizel family for, uh, for many years. And they called me, and they said, Jacques, we would like to open a branch. And I'll be honest with you, I was you know, uh, going back and forth, commuting every day to Lakewood. Uh, so that was a long, a long trip. And you know, I did that for about five and a half years. So I said to my wife, either we move there. And she definitely felt very uncomfortable because uh, uh, she, didn't, she doesn't wear a shed all or anything like that. So she said, eh, it's a little too firm for me. And you know, for me, you know, doing that back and forth was really terrible. So when the Cluzel said, Jacques, would you like with us to start our own branch? I said, why not? So we opened the first uh, office in Pensoken, almost like across the, the street where I, my former build, uh, office was. And we stayed there for five years until we moved to uh, West Berlin about three years ago. Uh, I love challenge. I love chocolate. And, and we'll talk about that because I think that, you know, that's, that's what I'm here for. But I wanted to give you all this background because, I mean, that, you know, uh, I mean, for me, my professional life is mostly you know, really revolves around chocolate. Uh, I started 28 years ago in this business uh, by accident, because in fact, um, I was working for another company in a completely different field. And you know, um, it was not going that well. And so I sent some resume. And one day I saw food companies looking for rep. Didn't know what it was. And I went to this place. And I had an, an, a meeting. And they said, OK, that's fine. You're, you're good. We want to hire you. I was, it was two weeks before I got married. And what was the most important part is that I left with like about 10 pounds of chocolates. You know, in the train, I was the chocolate. And I said, oh my god, I can't believe that. I'm working in chocolate. So everybody in my family, wow, you, that's great. That's crazy. I said, wow, don't get too excited. We'll see what will happen. And, and you know, it was interesting because, in fact, I discovered a couple of things that were very nice. The first one is the fact that, you know, Chocolate is a product that, or oh, I can say that, very few people will say, uh-uh, I don't like it. 
one, one unfortunately, uh, gentleman that I know that couldn't have chocolate is President Clinton. And, and I know that from, from a good source because, in fact, I was a couple of times invited to the White House, by, not by the president, unfortunately, but by the pastry chef. And the pastry chef, his name was Roland Messnier, now he's retired, but you know, he, he gave me the whole tour and, and I brought my family at the time and he gave us some chocolate the same way that the, the, you know, the, 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 the family, the first family will, will, will have. And so I said, well, okay, so chocolate is good, the president likes it. And he said, no, I'm sorry, Bill Clinton doesn't like chocolate. <laughs> okay, I mean, that means that you know, he likes something else and uh, that's a different story. But uh, <laughs> I won't get into that, I promise. But <laughs> Monica liked chocolate. <laughs> Probably. But that's <laughs> let's not get into that route. Anyway, so so th so that was interesting. So uh, the first thing is that it's true that you know when you mention chocolate, a lot of people will look at you whether you know I come back from France and you know the guy at the border said, "What do you sell?" and I said, "Chocolate." I have a big smile on his face or anybody. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that, you know, for me, it's a, it's a real, or I can say that, um, it's a real adventure for this product. And in, a, in about a month, I will bring 10 chefs from New York City and California to one of the plantation that we work for, and I will show them that. Because in fact, uh, chocolate started, you know, with these things. This is a cocoa pod. This is a dried one, but it's a real one. So in fact, you have to imagine that you know, this grows directly on a tree and directly from, from the trunk of the tree. So while a lot of um, fruits grow only from the branches, this one, you can have that directly from the trunk and sometimes really at the bottom of the trunk, even like kind of, uh, 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 or I can say that, a multitude. Sometimes you, you might have six or seven that are next to each other. And, and to me, what's amazing is that, you know, when you break that open, when it's fresh, and inside you have something that is kind of very white and like in a jello type, basically you put that in your mouth, it's very lemony or tangy, and then you spit the, the beans. And, and so, of course, if you want to, to have a look at it, uh, definitely, you know, I'll pass it on. And, and you know, the, the beans looks like that after you spit them. And what's amazing, this is the beans, and, and I have several, so again, same thing. I mean, that you know, if you want to pass them on, uh, I have more, so please go ahead. And what's uh, uh, amazing in, in, ter in terms of this fruit is that basically one guy came up with the idea of, you know, instead of throwing the pit, let's do something with this pit. And that, that's, yeah, because I mean, a fruit, when you eat an apricot, what do you do with the pit? You just throw it away. So one guy said, no, 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 that's ridiculous. We will, we will try that. Okay, so first of all, they decided that, you know, the beans would be a currency. So they didn't have any coins. So the more beans you would have, the richer you will be. And with the beans, you can exchange and buy a lot of things. And then after that, they said, okay, wow, that seems very interesting. Why don't we roast that and we grind it? And of course, the first people that were to do that were the Mayans and the Aztecs. And so that's what they did, is that they roasted it, and then after that they grind it, after removing the shell that you have around that, and you know, they make a kind of mixture, adding hot water and spices. And they drank that, and they said, wow, that's not so bad, we feel like invigorated and everything like that. And the first guy that discovered that to bring that to Europe was Hernan Cortes, he was a Spanish guy, and he went there, and you know, he was received as a king. Why? Because there was an old legend in the Mayans that, you know, there was this god called uh, Quetzalcoatl, and this god was traveling between the time, and he was wearing uh, like um, um, uh, colored feathers. And of course, at that time in Spain, you know, everything that they have on their head, you know, like the, the, the armor or everything like that, was also with kind of colored feathers. So when this guy arrived, the king, Montezuma, he said, wow, that's the guy from the legend. So they received him as a king and they gave him what they felt was their more, most precious uh, treasure. The, at the time, it was not really called chocolate, the way we spell it. It started with an X, but at the end, that was the same world. So the guy tried that and he said, wow, that's really good. That's, uh, that's very good. And on the top of that, the fact is that, you know, bringing that 
on the boat, instead of having a lot of food because it was, you know, the travel would last a few months, he would say, you know, with the chocolate, I need less and so I can go faster. And he brought that to Spain. And bringing that to Spain was interesting because, in fact, in Spain, of course, at that time, you had a lot of Jews that were in Spain. And, you know, basically, they learned the trade on how to make hot chocolate liquid. And that was very good, and they loved that. And in fact, from there, after you know the, the Jews were expelled from Spain, they went to south of France, to Bayonne. And we find the first chocolatier, which is always, always very interesting to see that you, know, you don't have that many Jews that are in the chocolate business, let's face it, as a chocolatier. Most of the time are not. But in fact, the first chocolatier were Jews, were from Bayonne, from the south of France. And so from there, at that time, it was only a drink. And you needed to have a commission from the king to be able to sell that. While at the same time, the infant of Spain married a French king, and she decided to bring that to Versailles, where everybody said, wow, that's great, that's a great product, and boom, the trend was, the buzz was on. They didn't have Facebook or Twitter, but that was exactly the same thing. So they started with that, they tried with the chocolate. Slowly and surely, people said, okay, that's good to have a drink. They added some, some sugar into it. Yeah, that's perfect, but it's not practical. I mean, that you know, you can't have always your thermos with your hot chocolate in, 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 in your uh, carriage or whatever it was. So a guy decided, you know, why don't we make that as a paste, as a solid? And I will eventually describe the process of making chocolate from the beans to finished product, but one guy found a way to make it solid. And that was the first, we were at the beginning of the 19th century, and that was the first way they made chocolate as a bar, the way we know them today. And from there, after that, you had a Swiss guy that said he was working with a friend that was in the milk process, and at that time they invented the, the dry milk, you know, the milk powder that we have today. So they found a way uh, to do the dry milk, and by the way, I don't know if you know the way it's done, but it's very simple. You have a kind of a very big hot uh, roll, and they pour over the milk, and because of the heat, the, the humidity will, le will leave, and then after that they will scrape off the, the, this kind of uh, small pieces, and these pieces are the milk without the water. So that's exactly what dry milk is. So the guy said, wow, that's interesting. Why don't we combine that together? And they combined the milk with the chocolate and came up the milk chocolate, as we know it today. So it's, it's, it's a very uh, interesting uh, story in a sense that, you know, it evolved over the years. And from there, people decided to add something into it, whether it was nuts, whether it was uh, um, a flavor to make like what we call the ganache and everything like that. And that's how the chocolate came up to life the way we know it today. Do you have any questions? Yeah. A lot of sugar-free candy, especially chocolate, has a diuretic effect. What ingredient is in, is in that type of candy? In, in, like in any sugar-free product, which we don't do because we feel that, you know, it's not the proper way. I think that, you know, all, all the aspartame and all the, 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 the sugar, uh, yeah, sorbitol. And sorbitol, uh, I mean, de derivative of sorbitol, because sorbitol can be used somehow as a preservative in a truffle, but not as a sugar-free. The prime of the sugar-free is that, is that you replace something that is real, sugar, and you replace that with something that, that is fake, that has, of course, some other effects. And one of them is the fact that, you know, uh, in terms of digestion and everything like that, it's not the best. Never knew that the chocolate was a fruit. Thank you. Never knew that. Learn something new every day. So that's very interesting because it's a fruit, but it became, as soon as it's open, it becomes a grain. And then when it's dry, it becomes a beans. And the word cocoa beans. But at first, it's a fruit. Okay. I might have missed it. The, the beans that you, you, that you passed around, mm -hmm. chocolate beans? Mm -hmm. Cocoa beans. That's cocoa beans. Mm -hmm. How do they break that apart? You say? Very simple. Let me, let me have that again, and I will show you on one of them, so you will have it. Okay, thank you. All right, that's very, very simple. Let's, let's get into the process, and let's have, if you have some questions before the process, let me answer that, and then I'll go back to the process. Is there any documentation that uh, Coco is actually an aphrodisiac? Uh, yes, I have four, four kids. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 
<laughs> and and there, were, there were times where I had nothing, so that means that you know it's really an aphrodisiac. No, no. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, no, of course, inside there is a, a product called theobromine, which, which has a little bit of the effect of the caffeine, hence the stimulants, but at the same time, the fact that it's aphrodisiac. But you know, what's very strange is that it is an aphrodisiac for sure, but at the same time, you know, the Mayans and the Aztecs completely disappeared. What does that mean? <laughs> that you know they were not. Yeah, so you never know. I, I understand there's antioxidants, sufficient number of antioxidants in there, so that if you get closer to the dark, you know, the higher levels of dark chocolate, actually be something helpful. In there. Absolutely. As a matter of fact, in uh, what Michel Cluzel does in France, and, and I will tell you what we do here, but what Michel Cluzel has has been doing since 1948. He's tried to make the highest possible uh, cocoa content. And we go up today to 99. And, and you said, why not 100? And, and that's very simple, because when you're at 99, uh, we still process it li like a chocolate, smooth chocolate. When it's 100%, it's a cocoa paste. And the cocoa paste is very harsh. So with the 99, we, in fact, we had an article in the American Heart Association, because on the top of that, this kind of things uh, has inside 54% of cocoa butter. And the cocoa butter is the good cholesterol that fights the bad cholesterol. So the more you eat dark chocolate and the darker the chocolate, the better it is for you, for sure. But after that, you know, it's a question, I mean that, you know, chocolate shouldn't be compared to, to, to drugs or medicine. I mean that, you know, for me, the, the, the chocolate that is the best for you is the one that you like the most. Of course, sometimes I hear people that say, ah, my best chocolate is white chocolate. Are you kidding? Chocolate, white chocolate is not chocolate. It has some cocoa butter in it, but it's not really chocolate. If, sure. When I was a kid growing up, they had two uh, companies, Barry Seedings and Barton's. Mm -hmm. the they still exist. Do they still exist? I haven't seen them. Before. Yeah, it's called. I mean, that you know, in the in the world of chocolate, there is what we call uh, artisan chocolate, and 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 the, unfortunately, this word artisan in the U.S. is very broad because sometimes you have artisan bread, and I can tell you for sure that you know nobody in the plant has been seen <laughs> to make the bread. So while in France, artisan means that it's made with your hands and that you work in a small group. So it's a very, very different. But yes, there are a, a little bit of differences. And I will explain what makes the difference. As a matter of fact, when you will leave, I brought for you uh, two samples, one of the dark and one of the milk, two small bars that we, made in, we make in France. So each one of you will have the opportunity to taste that. And you'll tell us after that what you think. So uh, if you want, let's, unless you have a question, I'll get you into the you have about 70, 70 beans in, or 70 grains in the pod, and, and roughly you need uh, about one pod for one bar, if it's a good chocolate bar. I've noticed, with, with, especially with dark chocolate, that the different manufacturers, even though they may have the same percentage of, of, uh, of, of cocoa in it, mm -hmm. They taste a lot different. Absolutely. But because I mean that you know numbers are just numbers. I mean that you know or word is a word. You know, bread and croissant. Take this example. Or even bagel. I mean that you know you have bagel that you will buy on, in the supermarket that could last six months without a problem. You have another bagel, <laughs> it's true. And you have bagel that you can buy with a guy that will make them in the morning. You leave them for the next day. They are hard as a rock. You can't even eat them. It's completely different. And same thing for the chocolate. So, so let me explain, in fact, what makes after that the difference. Why what we do at Michel Cruzel, uh, makes it a little bit different than what you have mostly on the market. And uh, also how I came up with the kosher uh, chocolate, and especially in, in, in this area or uh, somehow because we have a store in New York, why we came up with this idea, and I, I'm not sure that it was really the best idea that we you know, might have, because again, you, you have a lot of people that are used to a certain price and certain quality in chocolate, and sometimes they are not ready uh, you know, for something much higher than that, because they said, I don't see the difference. Chocolate is chocolate, percentage is the same. So let's start with these beans, because it all started that way. So, so the uh, beans like that, 
uh, when they arrive, the first thing that we do, I'm sorry, no, let's backtrack a little bit because I think it's important. After they harvested, so I told you that you know it was surrounded by a white jello. The, this jello is called the mucilage. And basically, it's what will give the flavor to the chocolate. So one of the differences that you will have in the taste is that you have some company that don't, don't want to go into the fermentation process. The fermentation process is the fact that you know this white jello will somehow penetrate in the beans to give the taste. So what they do is that at the plantation, for seven days, they will have to change and to move every day in a different box all the beans because we have what we call the fermentation stages. And you have two, one that is called alcoholic, one that is called lactic. I won't get into the detail because it's really boring, but it's extremely important. You have some people that say, whoa, whoa, whoa. seven days with this price, I don't want to wait. Wash them off and dry them. And that's what they do, because the next stage is the drying. But again, the drying could be done in a different ways, because the drying will remove the humidity and the water, therefore, into the beans. The planter, is, his best interest is to leave as much humidity as possible, because it's the weight, and he sells by the weight. But at the same time, the guy that will get that, the, 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 the industrial or the chocolatier, will need the least humidity. So that's what will make also the price, because when the beans arrive at a, at, a, at, a, at a plant, the first thing that anybody does is that they pick up some samples and they check them. What's the humidity content? How many are damaged? How many are um, rents or rancid? And so on and so forth. And based on that, that will make somehow the price of the lot. For us, it's a little bit different because we buy what we call premier cru de plantation, which is in fact the best of one estate. So it's like, you know, if we say in Cherry Hill, we want only the trees that grew up, grew up in, at the JCC. So they charge us much more because in fact it's very located. Most of the big industrial, they will gather everything that they can in the whole area or blend that to some product from Ivory Coast, from Ghana, from a lot of countries, and that makes a difference. So already you have already two kinds of differences before even it gets to, to, the, to the plant or to the chocolaterie. When they arrive, and we've checked that, then the following step is really to do what? Is to remove the shell and the germs. So we have, of course, we don't do that by hand. If not, we, it will cost like 10 times more or 100 <laughs> times more. But basically what we do is that we do exactly what I'm doing with a machine. We roast a little bit the beans, just enough to remove the shell. And then inside, up. Voila. Inside, this is what we will get. Inside, we get this product, which is really the beans, and it, it, that doesn't have any more the germs. And you know, it's not solid. It's in small parts. But this has everything that you need to make the base for the chocolate. So what we do for, after the, we've removed that and we finish the, 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 the roasting is that we will press that, we will grind that together to make a paste. This paste is called cocoa liquor, cocoa mass, or cocoa paste. It's three names, but exactly the same thing. It's 100% cacao, that's what I was mentioning, that is very harsh. You can eat that, but it's not refined, and you don't get a very good feeling on your mouth. When we've done that, this cocoa paste is obtained, then we have two ways of using it. The first one, very simple, we add sugar, blend it, and we make chocolate, dark chocolate. Like for example, uh, all the Hershey kisses or all the chocolate chips that you make in the, put in the cookies are made like that. It's basic paste and sugar. The more sugar, the least expensive. That's why if you look at something and it starts with sugar, it's never a good sign. That means that you have more than 50% that is sugar compared to the, the cacao or the cocoa that you supposed to be higher normally. Okay, so far so good? So you have the cocoa paste, you add sugar, and eventually vanilla, you make the dark chocolate. Now, for the professionals, they need something that is more refined. So what we do is that we again go back to this paste, and then like olives, we will press it. So we have a mechanical press, and we'll just press that as hard as we could. We will obtain two products. One is a liquid product called cocoa butter, 
And the other one is a dry product that after some work will become cocoa powder. Okay? So cocoa mass, you press it, cocoa butter on one end, cocoa powder on the other one. Cocoa powder, you can use it like that. You put that on the top of cakes. You will put that to make a hot chocolate, although I don't think that that's the best way and everything like that, but you can do it. <coughs> but the most precious part is the cocoa butter. Why? Because in any good chocolatier will need to add that to the chocolate. So if we go back to the real recipe of a good dark chocolate, and I will tell you how you recognize a good dark chocolate, is that you take the cocoa paste that you had at the beginning, you add some cocoa butter, so some liquid, then you add your sugar, and then you add your vanilla. You grind it again very thin, and then after that you have another step that I will explain later on. Okay, so that's clear. If you want to make milk chocolate, you just add milk powder to it. So the cocoa paste is really, or this, is really the base to do everything. Okay? If you want white chocolate, you will take only the cocoa butter, you will add milk, powder, and sugar, and you have your white chocolate. So far, so good. Okay. Now, uh, what makes the difference into chocolate? <coughs> All the steps could be adjusted, because in fact what happens is that you, know, you can save money in all the process. In the roasting, again, if you leave a little bit more humidity, at the end you have more, uh, more weight. So it's, you know, you, you save money. Uh, the same way if when you remove the shell, you leave a little bit of the shells, 5%, 3%, same thing. You save also money. That's a way, to, you know, that you change that. After that, it's the type of sugar that you use. For example, in Europe, a lot of sugar that they use is what we call beet sugar because it's less expensive, they produce that, and the EEC has so much beets that you know, they give subsidies to, to, uh, to, to ship the sugar elsewhere, which of course here we pay taxes when the chocolate arrives because in the US they said, well, well we don't really need, need more sugar, so the, the chocolate that has more sugar has more taxes on it. So it's always reverse. But still, you have the sugar that counts. For us, we use exclusively cane sugar. And we don't have any cane sugar in France, so everything has to come from the islands, costs money. The vanilla that we use, a lot of people will use a vanilla liquid. We don't. We take the vanilla beans or pods and we grind it at the same time. So that's another way, just in the ingredients, Beside the cost of the beans, that can be very different. But beside that, that will make a difference. And then after that, in the process, it's also the way you grind it. If you grind it very, uh, I would say, you have different rolls. If you leave the rolls open, you will feel the grain on the chocolate. A good way to feel if the chocolate is very high quality, put that in your mouth. If it doesn't melt right away and you feel a grainy, that means that it's not a high quality chocolate. That means that you know basically they wanted to cut corners and so they process it quickly. The same way there is a second step that is very important called the conching. In fact, I compare always you know, the, the, the grinding and the conching to uh, uh, sandpaper. You know, you have to redo a table, you will use a very harsh uh, uh, sand, sandpaper to, to remove the paint, okay, or the varnish. But after that, you know, your table or your piece of wood is not very smooth. Then you have to take a very fine uh, sandpaper to go around and to make it very, very smooth. Same thing, the conching, that's the work of the conching that it is. It's a big machine that will blend that, mix that completely, and then that will remove, first of all, the humidity and the bad acids, but at the same time, that will make all the particles rounder. So we have a first dry conching and then a liquid conching when we add the cocoa butter. And when we do that, you make the thing smooth, and when you put that on your, in your mouth, it should melt and kind of envelop your palate without having, being harsh or anything like that. Even if it's strong, it could be very strong, like 85% uh, or 99. But still, you won't have this feeling that, wow, it's burning my throat because it's too, too much. Okay? Any question on that? Would you just say that word one more time? Coaching? Conching. C-O-N-C-H-I-N-G. Conching. Yes. And in fact, it's, uh, you have in this, uh, so, you, so you have two types of conching. You have a vertical and a horizontal. But that's exactly the same thing. It's basically uh, granite rolls. 
that will turn in different uh, directions to bring all this paste and make it very, very smooth. That's, uh, compared to the grinding where, in fact, the grinding, you will grind everything at the same level, the sugar and the beans at the same level, the crunching is really the refining process. So you have sometimes some people that say, wow, the crunching, we do 24 hours, we do 48 hours. Timing makes no sense. Each batch is different. And what you want to achieve will make the time of crunching that you need. Does the shininess indicate any change in quality? The shininess when? The finished product. So for the finished product, there are two things that can bring shiny. First of all, is the amount of cocoa butter. The more cocoa butter, the shinier it could be. But also, it's the way you process it. If you make it in a mold, it will get the shine from the mold. So to, uh, ultimately, you will have a chocolate, a, a chocolate bonbon, a chocolate truffle that will be shinier than if it's enrobed. The same way you might have sometimes you buy some chocolate and it's warm. You leave that in your car and say, oh my god, the next day it's all white. I have to trash them. <laughs> Not at all. It's just the fact that you have the cocoa butter that went up to the surface. It might be a little bit different in te texture, but it's not bad. Uh, under, I'll just say, normal storage conditions in your pantry or whatever, uh, regardless of what you see written as the usual expiration date on things, uh, practically speaking, what's the length of time? That's an excellent question. First of all, never put chocolate unless there is cream in it. But for example, a chocolate bar, never put that in the fridge. Humidity is the worst for the chocolate. If there is something a chocolate doesn't like, is water. So in the fridge, you will have definitely a lot of humidity. So in the pantry, it, it, depending on the temperature, but I would say that a, a good temperature for a, a chocolate bar will be 65 degrees, 68 degrees. Chocolate doesn't like too many changes in temperature. It's better to leave it always at 70 than to go to 40 and then the next day uh, 75 and then again to 43 and so on and so forth. Now, now the length of the chocolate, I would say that you know basically you have three, th three kinds. If it's white chocolate, it's very short. Tops, I would say a couple of months, three months. After that, you know the milk chocolate the milk in the chocolate, I'm sorry, will kind of uh, give you a kind of soap effect. So it's not really good. But it has nothing to do with the chocolate, it's just the, the milk. If you have milk chocolate, it will last longer, at least six months to a year, at least. In good condition, you can keep that probably longer than that. Dark chocolate, honestly, I would pr almost say a lifetime. I mean, I remember that uh, in, in my first job in, in, in France, I was living in, in an apartment, and you know, I had, um, uh, they, they sent me sample. And, and the guy that was my boss was a very funny guy in the sense that, you know, he said, okay, whenever there is a problem with the customers, instead of doing a credit, you give him free chocolate, free bars. The bars were like uh, 11 pounds, so big bar. So one day he said, okay, I'm sending you some. And, and of course I had, um, a ba not re yeah, in the, in the third floor basement, I had a space to put my stuff there. And um, one day the guy sh came up and he said, okay, I have some samples for you. Oh, okay, good. He gave me like 900 pounds of chocolate. Yeah. <laughs> no elevator, nothing. So I had to schlep everything from the, from the ground to the third down level. I mean, it was, it was a basement. It was unbelievable. So of course, I was very reluctant when there was a problem to go back to my basement, take like 50 pounds, bring them back up, put that in my car, and it was a big headache. So when I left France, and, and my brother took over the apartment, but at some point he, 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 he left, he said, Jacques, what do we do with what, what we have? I said, wow, they are very old. They are probably at least six, seven, eight years old. I said, okay, let's try. We open some, perfect. Like, like wine, <laughs> like wine, like a good wine. So, so you can keep uh, normally, uh, uh, again, a solid bar of chocolate. If it has a filling in it, it's completely different. Because if it has cream or butter, or uh, nuts into it, that might change. The nuts, the, the, the nuts will rancid, the, the, the butter will uh, become sour, or, or, or anything like that. Th that, in fact, what also uh, uh, 
give me the, I would say, the transition to kosher. Um, in, in 19, uh, when was that? In 1984, 86, I was working for this parent company in France. And um, I, at, at that time, I said, you know what? We should make some kosher chocolate. And, and they said, are you crazy? What's the market? So I made a small study for them in France a little bit in the US, but I had no clue what could be the market and everything like that. And I said, that could be good to do. And they did it. To this day, they do that. They, they still do that. Uh, when I started to work with Michel Crisel, uh, at first, and they said, look, we had this headache. We made for somebody in Israel, and they didn't pay us. And the guy went bankrupt. And we had, the, I mean, it, it was a big nightmare. So they said, no way. And then what happened is that after a couple of years, we, we um, uh, we, we got, uh, uh, we opened a store on 5th Avenue. But on 5th Avenue between 47 and 48, which means that we are exactly in the heart of the Diamond District. So almost like uh, first, uh, the building where we are, it's called the Diamond Tower. And so you have 98% that are Orthodox Jews. So my manager, who was not, uh, was not Jewish, said to me, Jacques, uh, there is something wrong here. I mean, everybody comes, are you kosher? No. Are you kosher? No. Are you kosher? No. We are losing a lot of business. I said, okay, fine. I called Michel Crisel and his family, and I said, okay, we have to do something. We have to become kosher. Oh, Jacques, don't tell me about that. It's a big headache and everything. Finally, they said, okay, we can compromise. We'll make the raw ingredients kosher, and then after that, you're on your own. Okay. So I said, fine, I want the praliné, I want the cocoa nibs, I want the cocoa paste, I want a couple of things. Okay, so that was the first headache. Then we said, okay, fine, so you have to move. So I was in Pensoken uh, in, in 5,000 square feet and we decided that we needed bigger. So we searched for two years. Finally, we found something on Cooper Road. I mean, between Cooper and, and Route 73. It's called uh, Cooper and Executive Park. And there was a building that, was, uh, that belonged to uh, St. Jude's Medical. So the building was in very good shape and uh, we said, okay, is that really the, the good timing? Uh, we have to start at some point. So, so we, we got the building, we bought the building, and we said, let's start. In this building, what's interesting is that because you have like, like six um, different suites, and we took all, all of them, we were able to split that in two parts. One part that is basically our office and the warehouse for all the products from, coming from France, and the other part that we split it between the kitchen and between the museum um, that Dave mentioned before. Uh, and that's interesting, I will tell you what we do there uh, as well, because I think that it's, it's, it's also, I think, a, a, a good way to do something very unique in this area. So um, we said, okay, fine, now we need a chef. Okay, no problem. So we put an ad. We had like 50 resumes. So I selected 10 and I said, okay. I called one by one and I said, you have to come to the chocolaterie in Danville that, that day and you will do a, a tasting. No problem, I'm a good chef. Yeah, yeah, no problem. But there is a twist, okay? What's the twist? I want you to work without milk, without butter, without cream. Silence. People said, is that a joke? No, it's not a joke. You have to work without that. What do you mean? We can't make a ganache, we can't make a chocolate, a pastries without butter, without cream, without milk. Yes, that exists. It's called parv. Or parev or parve, depending on how you pronounce it. So finally, we gathered seven chefs and they did something. Some of them very poor quality and a couple of them very good. And we selected a chef that we still have with us, and we created a, a line of pastries, not only of chocolate, but also on pastries that are kosher par, for a couple of reasons. Because I felt that you know, if you want to eat a normal meat, uh, a normal meal, you will have meat in it. You want the pastries after that, and if you keep kosher, you can't mix both. So you need something different. So we did that. Then we had some people that says, "Oh wow, you know that's good for me. I'm lactose intolerant." Can I have that? Sure, there is no milk. So we started the, the process like that of doing kosher, um, kosher chocolate. What was interesting is that in, in, in like all the stories, you know, all, all, we started to put that in, in the store in New York. And, and I will tell you a, a brief, uh, a brief uh, story that I hope you will feel funny. Uh, if not, please, just so you don't embarrass me, laugh a little bit, because then I will feel that, you know, it's good. Is that, you know, there is this guy that, uh, one day is close to a, 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 a psychiatric hospital. 
And you know, he opened the bakery shop and the pastry shop. And he said, fine, he opens, very pleased, he's making beautiful product, and one, after an, an hour, a guy showed up, and he said, do you have cucumber tarts? The woman said, no, we have raspberry, we have apple, we have cranberry, uh, cucumber tarts. Now, the guy leaves. At night, she said to her, yeah, go ahead. When you left France, did you leave France with your brother? When no. your wife left France? No, no, just myself. In the middle of the story? That's fine, that's fine. Don't, don't worry. I, 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 I was by myself. I, I was by myself. When you came here, did you come with your brother? No. No, just with my wife and my kids. Okay. Can we hear the story? Sure. So anyway, so, so at night, uh, oh, okay, so I, and I'll wrap up. At night, you know, she said that to her husband, and the husband said, okay, the guy is a joke. I mean, that you know, cucumber tart, that does not exist. The next day, and for the next few days, several people showed up. Do you have cucumber tarts? So she said, wow, wow, that's ridiculous. So she said to her husband, we're losing money. So the husband said, okay, that's enough. Tonight I will make you cucumber tarts. They make cucumber tarts, and of course the next morning, the guy, the first guy showed up again. And he said, do you have cucumber tarts? And she says, she's very proud. She said, yes, we have cucumber tarts. We have the big one, the small one, everything. And the guy looks at her and said, that disgusting, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's a little bit what happened a little bit for us, is that you know, everybody was asking for kosher, and then when we had the kosher, all these people came and said kosher, oh yeah, but you're too expensive. So that was exactly what happened to us. Uh, yeah, sure. Just one thing I want to share with you guys. My father was in Patton's Third Army, and he liberated Paris. Ah, that's great. Uh, and he said to me that walking down the streets the chocolate bar could buy you anything you wanted. Absolutely. <laughs> That's for sure. Not That's even Paris. Great. So, I mean, that you know, you know the story. You will have the, the taste for that. In the museum, we have uh, tours. So we organize tours, mostly right now for, uh, for schools. Because at the same time, we have sometimes some French class that are very happy because at the same time we do part of the tour in French and so they like it and so uh, if someday one, you want to do a tour why not we can organize that as well and thank you again for uh, having me today. Do you have information on where you're located? Sure, yeah, yes, absolutely. Thank you. I have something for you. Oh. Um, an appreciation for your attendance. We give you this certificate of appreciation oh, so much. and uh, an invite back uh, for the next year. You are now a member of the South Jersey Men's Club. Thank so, you. I appreciate so thank you that. very much. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank thank you. Um, Jacques has samples for us. Yes, absolutely. And uh, you also have a responsibility. Jacques, if you would. Thank you. They might be upside down. You have two things? Okay. Jacques, can you yeah, can you hold that hold that for a second? I hold that, yes. No, no, you, oh. hold that what you're doing and pick our winner. Oh. Voila. It's four eight eight one six six. Here. All right. Ed Silver. No, we don't trust him, but uh, yes, he's right. Only three bucks. Okay. Don Weisenstein has a couple items. Our our president elect. Just real quick, an update directly from the field. In game one, up big was in seven. Oh. So we're a little, and we're down 0-2 in the second game. Nothing is, any word on MAR or Federation, Boston, anything? No, that, that's up to, uh, I'm not even following it. Okay. Um, okay, well, samples are coming around. Um, thank you all for coming. Our next meeting in May, we'll have the uh, director of security from the Israeli consulate will be here. Should be a very interesting meeting. And we will have our election of officers all coming up in the May meeting. So thank you all. Get your sample. Uh, we already did it. You lost. Take care. Bye-bye.